there we go. How, yeah, sorry? The word, it's coming, it's coming. Um, oh, I just, I just enjoyed that time of worship this morning. In fact, I'll before I do that. Fru told me I should, we should keep this, and I'm going to put it right at the front, she said, so that, so that people can see it. Uh, this is just there as a reminder um, that I need to fix it. No, that's not the reminder. The reminder is there for us. We've been using this, this chair as a kind of an illustration um, of our brokenness and the things that are in us that, that kind of need attention and that we can bring it to God to, uh, to help fix um, the things in us. So um, I'm not going to refer to it much over the next couple of weeks, but I am going to keep bringing it and I am going to keep putting it there because I want you to remember who we are and who our fixer is, okay? Who the one who's going to actually deal with this stuff is. So there it is, right at the front. I'll try not to trip over it. Um, Okay, let me just pray. Lord God, I thank you uh, for the time that we've been able to share this morning together as a church family. I pray that, um, Lord, we're not stopping waiting on you right now. We are continuing our wait on you this morning as we open the word, as we listen to the message that you've got for us today, God. I pray that our hearts will be challenged and comforted and encouraged and just made bigger because we, uh, as we draw closer to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I wonder, have you ever made a decision? Yeah. Have you ever made a decision in a moment that has long-lasting consequences? A decision like it just kind of happened in, in kind of an instant, but it was a momentary decision, but it had far-reaching consequences. There was a process attached to that momentary decision. Uh, for example, you, were, you went into a coffee shop and, and there was a chance kind of momentary encounter with someone that led you to a new job or a career change. Or you had a, a momentary lapse of judgment that led to an injury. I've had that. Let me tell you about my son JJ uh, just very quickly. He uh, once, in a moment, tried to jump over a fence, two-footed jump. And that led to a week and a half in hospital, it led to surgery, and it led to months of rehabilitation. Things in a moment that last a long time. Um, maybe you've had an impulse purchase while you've been out around the shops, and that momentary decision led to months or years of paying it back. Or uh, there was a moment where you make a decision to watch a movie with your girlfriend, and it changes everything. Let me tell you about that moment. So I was there, I was 21 years old, and I was at my girlfriend's house. And we were there, we were watching uh, uh, a television, and this movie came on, uh, Arthur, I don't know if you remember the movie Arthur, with Dudley Moore and Liza Minnelli, it's a, kind of a, it's a romantic comedy from the 1980s. And this movie is about this rich guy, rich young English guy, who is supposed to get married to this heiress, but he has a chance encounter, a chance meeting with a waitress who he falls in love with, and the whole film is kind of them, how, how he, you know, he, he has to kind of upset his family by going after his, his true love, and, and it's, it's a film, it won like four Oscars, uh, Burt Bacharach did the, did the score for this movie, uh, and there's a song, a song, there's a song that won an Oscar for this movie, I don't know if you know, when you get caught between the moon and New York City, the best thing you can do there we go, he's fall in love, all right? So I was there, it was a bit of a perfect storm. We were watching this movie together. The lights were low, the fire was roaring, and the guy gets the girl on the movie, and in a mad moment, a spur of the moment thing, I turned to Fru, and I said, will you marry me? Oh. And she must have had a moment as well, because she said, yes. It was one of those spur of the moment moments but it has far-reaching consequences right and here we are 29 years later still still working out the process yeah I'm not saying it was bad all right it was it was actually the best decision that she ever made <laughs> <laughs> She's right, you're not going to say whatever I like. Mm, yeah. 
Or maybe you had a moment where you turned to your, to your husband or your wife and you said those amazing words, shall we have a baby? Shall we have a little boy or a little girl? Yeah, here I am. Yeah, and, and you know, and the thing about that moment, it could, that decision could be made in a moment. And obviously, when you're making the baby, that's a great, dis- that's a great moment, right? But then, but then the moment the baby's born, and suddenly you're in a process. Suddenly, you find yourself in a process because that little boy or that little baby girl, suddenly they can start to walk, and it's a nightmare. You're chasing them around everywhere, trying to, get, trying to stop them getting into trouble. And then they can talk and they don't stop asking questions. And then they can spend. And suddenly, all that freedom and money that you had before you had kids, that's, that's gone. But you can't leave the process. You've got to see the process right through. And in a couple of months' time, our son JJ is getting married. And surely that's the end of the process. Surely that's it. Who knows? Yeah, all the people who know. No, no, it doesn't stop. Let me tell you about another moment. 11 or 12 years ago, uh, Fru and I made a moment to take our family to go and see a choir in a church. That sounds harmless, doesn't it? To go and watch a choir. What can happen when you go and see a choir? We went went and saw a choir singing at a church. Well, this choir was a, um, uh, a Romanian choir, Romanian children from an orphanage in Romania, run by a Christian uh, charity, and they, they sang the songs, and they interspersed the songs with a uh, descript- kind of description of their life, this is what our life is like in this kind of Christian run, kind of family orphanage, and it could have been a moment, that could have been it, we could have walked away and never thought of it again, but we decided, actually this, this looks kind of interesting, and our kids need a dose of reality, so let's take them on a mission trip to visit this Romanian orphanage and see and, and we go and help them. We go and help them build a house. That's what we did. So we took our kids, we went and helped build a house, and we looked at the orphanage, saw what they're doing, went and saw the alternative option for these kids, which was a state orphanage, which was awful. And again, this could have been a moment, it could have been the end of the moment as well. We could have come back home and gone, okay, well, that was good, that was nice. But we got home and we saw, well, we saw what a difference this kind of setup made. It was uh, the way that this kind of charity run they had kind of ten houses all in a circle and in each house they put a Christian uh, man and a woman, a a husband and wife and then they filled that house with 15 or 16 kids, all different ages and we saw what a difference it made to the life of these kids compared to the life in the state orphanage and we said to our, we said to our, actually look, maybe we can do something like that, maybe we can offer our home as a foster home, maybe we could become a foster family and that started a process, just that conversation. And then kind of a year or so later, after we'd done training and kind of filled in all the forms, we, we welcomed our first foster child with us. And it's a process that we've been in for the last 10 years. And it's great. I mean, we love it. We feel like it's our calling. But it was a moment that led to the process. For most of us in this room, there has been a moment, a defining moment where we accepted the invitation that Jesus gave us to follow him. There was a moment where we said, yeah, yes, I want to do that. I want to, I want to follow Jesus. I want to give Jesus my life. I want to give him my heart. Sometimes that moment when you do that, it can be like a bolt out of the blue. It can be, it can be an instant. It can be just uh, as if from nowhere. Uh, Paul, the apostle, had a moment like that, didn't he? He, was, he had his life. He had his life track. He knew where he was going. He was on, he was on his way to Damascus. He was going to be the persecutor of Christians, and he was going to go and imprison some Christians. He had papers and everything. But Jesus met him on that road like a bolt of lightning and changed the whole course of his life. Last, uh, last week in small group, we were looking at uh, Jesus' disciples, uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John. They were fishermen and they were, they, there's a, the, the account goes that they were, they've been out fishing all night. They caught nothing and then suddenly there's this guy, Jesus, who has to come into their boat and he says to them, look, oh, you know, stop cleaning your nets, take your boats, go out to deeper waters because um, there's something that's going to happen. And Peter's like, well, we've been fishing all night, like... We're the experts here. Why are you telling us what to do? They're not biting today. And he said, no, no, go and do this. So they do and they put the, put the net out and they capture two boatloads of fish. 
It's a miracle. And then Jesus utters those three words that he offers to all of us. He said to the disciples, come and follow me. Come follow me. And I just want to pause that scene. I want you to hold that scene in your head. Peter's there with his net. There's fish all around him in the boat. And Jesus has said to him, come follow me. What are they going to do? How are they going to respond to this, to this moment? These uneducated, rough men, these guys had no real prospects other than fishing for the rest of their lives. And suddenly Jesus has invited them to join him. And in this moment, Jesus also paints a picture of what the process is going to look like. He says, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men, of people. I'm going to take what you're good at, fishing, and I'm going to make a shift. I'm going to turn it and you're going to be doing that for my glory and for my kingdom. And they have a choice in that moment. And what do they do? Well, they bring their boats to the shore. I expect they clean their nets. They fold them up. They lay them in their boat. And then they follow Jesus into town. Whatever he's going to do. It's a lightning bolt moment. And for all we know, this is a single encounter that they have that leads to a moment that begins a brand new process that will, that will last them for the whole of their lives. And in some cases, it will actually take their lives from them, this process. And that decision to follow Jesus, you know what? It is always made in a moment. But sometimes, it's not, it's not always a bolt out of the blue. Sometimes there's a process that leads to the moment. I've heard it described like this. There's a, you know, for the life of a believer, there's this uh, scale, if you like, a scale that goes from minus 10 through to plus 10. And the, uh, the, the process of minus 10 to zero, zero is the moment where you have that encounter and you make that decision. Uh, but to get from minus 10 to zero, there's sometimes a process. So uh, it could be that you had, uh, you encountered some Christians on the high street who, who made you think and it moved you from minus 10 to minus 8. Maybe you had a nan or a relative or somebody in your family who has a faith and they spoke to you about their faith and that moves you from minus 8 to minus 5. Maybe you've been to church and it's Christmas or it's Easter or you've been to a wedding and something has stirred in your heart and that's moved you from minus 5 to minus 3. And then... Um, there comes a circumstances in your life. Something happens and you realize, actually, my life, there's an emptiness in my life that I want to fill. And that moves you from minus three to minus one. And suddenly you're in that zero moment where Jesus, where the Holy Spirit says, come on, come follow me. And you make that decision. There was a guy called Nicodemus who had more of a process uh, to his moment. He, uh, we've talked about him before, but he's a guy who came, comes to Jesus at night because he's a religious leader. He doesn't want the other religious leaders to know what he's doing. But he's got questions. He's noticed some things. He's seen maybe some miracles that Jesus has done. Maybe he's heard people talk about what, who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And he's got questions and, and he's moved. He's moving up the scale. But he comes to Jesus at night and he says, you know, tell me, what, what is this about? And, and Jesus says to him, look, you've got to be born again. You've got to have this moment when you step from the life that you're in into this new life. You've got to, have, you've got to be born again. And we don't actually read Nicodemus' moment. The Bible doesn't tell us about that. But it does tell us, kind of much later on, that he is the guy who is there at Jesus' death. He's there. He's anointing Jesus' body. And he's then uh, helping um, the guy put him in Jesus in the tomb. So at some point, there's been this crossover, this moment. He's had his zero moment. And he started uh, on his journey of being a disciple. And sometimes that happens. For, for some people there is a, there is a, a bolt out of the blue light, uh, moment. For some people there is a journey towards the moment where the opportunity comes and then you're ready and the Holy Spirit calls you to be born again. And for those of us, those of you who have already had that zero moment, that moment where you've given your lives to Jesus, you know that that moment wasn't an isolated event. It didn't just happen and then that's it, you go home and forget about it. It led you to the process, the process of one to ten, the, the process of, that we're all kind of working toward, the process of being a disciple. And that's really what this series 
is about. The process when you've given your life, when you've had that moment, you've given your life to Jesus and now you're on this process that that moment has led to. What does that process look like? What actually changes? Well, so far in this series, so we've, this has been our scripture over the last couple of weeks. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. This is really, this is the foundation of the process for us to shape our lives around Jesus, to become like Jesus. Everything else that happens in the life of a disciple, thank you guys, is built around this idea that we are made, uh, we, are, we are being made into the shape of Jesus. And if you read back right at the beginning of the Bible, we read that God made human beings, and how did he make them? He made them in his image. So we were uh, right at the start of time. He made Adam and Eve, and he made them in the shape of himself. But then we all know what happened. Sin came into the world. They made, they made a mistake, and, and sin came into the world. And suddenly, uh, they, had to be, they were banished from the Garden of Eden, and the Holy Spirit that God had breathed into them couldn't live in them anymore. Because God is a, is a holy God. And holiness cannot live with sin. They can't abide together. And so the Holy Spirit left. And, and God's plan from that moment was to bring people back to himself. And so we come to this idea where God had to make a way where this could be our reality again. Where we could be in his image. Where we could be the shape of him, where we could be made new, where we could be declared righteous, where we could have the Holy Spirit again. And so we come to what is arguably the most famous verse in all of Christendom. And this verse actually comes right on the back of Jesus's, when he's having that chat with Nicodemus, this verse uh, follows that chat. And this is God's process to bring him back to himself. And uh, this is, John says, for God so loved the world. That is an inclusive statement right there. God loved the world. You know, this society is all about inclusivity, right? Being inclusive. You can't get more inclusive than that. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever, again, that's an inclusive statement. Whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his son to be the sacrifice for our sin so that when we take that moment that he offers us, when he says to us, come follow me, and we say, yes, Lord, I will follow you, at that moment, we can have the Holy Spirit back with us. Again, we are given eternal life, and the Holy Spirit guarantees our inheritance. God's presence in us, once again, making us into the image of God and beginning the process of us conforming to the shape of his son. This is God's work in us. Paul writing to the Philippian church says, be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, what work is that? The work of making us into the likeness of his son, making us into the shape of Jesus. He who began that work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. He who began it is going to finish it. He who moved you from that, from, on that zero moment is going to bring you to plus ten. When? On the day of Christ Jesus. This is returning to the time when Jesus will return. The Bible is full of, of information about Jesus coming back and taking his people to be with him. And at that moment, that's the moment when the job is done. And until that moment, the job's going to keep... That's the plus ten moment. That's when we, when we arrive, when we're made, when the masterpiece is finished, when the final piece in the puzzle is there, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. We will be all that God has called us and made us to be on that day. Again, uh, the Apostle John, the one of the ones who Jesus called in that fishing boat that day, later on in his life, he wrote this, Dear friends, now we are children of God now so he's talking to people who have had the moment now we are children of God that's happened that's a reality he said and what we will be has not yet been made, made known 
So we are and we will be. We are and we will be. We are, we are in the shape of Jesus. We are in his image. But we will be made into the shape of Jesus. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. So we're in a process. We're in a process as disciples that is there designed to make us conform to the shape of Jesus. So what does this process look like? Well, there are a number of things. There are a great many things, actually, that the Bible tells us. Um, this is the thing that makes, sets us apart, that makes us disciples. Things that we should do if we are Jesus' disciples. He says that we should love people. This is his greatest commandment, that you should love one another. He says that we should abide in the word. He said, if you are my disciples, you will abide in the word. You will live your life according to what the word says, what the Bible says. He says, you will obey my commandments if you are a disciple. You will be worshippers. You will be witnesses. All these things are what sets apart a disciple of Jesus. And maybe we're going to unpack some of them in future weeks. But today, I want to focus on just one area as we kind of uh, finish this talk. And this is the one thing, this one area, we've already mentioned it a little bit. This is one area that makes us effective in all those other areas. Okay, As disciples of Jesus, we need help. And that help is the form of the Holy Spirit. So this one area that we want to focus on just for the last little bit of this message is how do we follow the Holy Spirit. We need to follow and listen to, to the guide that is given uh, to us. We cannot do the process that we're called to do without the Holy Spirit. To trust and to obey his voice. Again, Jesus uh, says this, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. So this is Jesus talking to his disciples. This is actually the night where he's about to be betrayed and crucified. And he says to them, I will pray the Father and, and he will give you another helper. Okay, now this word, another, it's an interesting word. There are two Greek words that are translated another. The first Greek word is the word alos. Alos. And the second Greek word is heteros. Heteros. We've got alos and heteros. Now, let me give you an example to uh, help explain these two words. I remember when my kids, especially my two boys, Gideon and JJ, when they were younger, and they were going to get dressed for something formal, and Gideon would quite often come out in a ratty tracksuit and trainers like, that were kind of really nasty, like tracksuit and trainers. We're going, Look, we're going to a wedding. You can't wear that. And I would say, go and get another outfit. Go and get another outfit. An outfit, and I have to be quite clear because he would likely go in and find another tracksuit, just a cleaner one, uh, and, and sliders, okay? Change his training. And I'm going, no, no. You need to have another outfit of a different kind. That's what the word heteros means. It's another of a different kind. And then there's this other word, alos, which is another of the same kind. Okay, so you can have another of a different kind, which is heteros, or another of the same kind, which is alos. Now, let me explain about alos. Uh, I don't know if you know me, I'm a, little bit, I'm a little bit strange when it comes to my dressing habits as well. I like to wear the same thing all the time. You see me, I wear my black t-shirts, right? That's what I wear. Um, but it, uh, what you don't know is if I go to a shop and I, like, and I find a jumper that I like, I won't just buy one. I will buy multiple of the same thing because I think, well, I'll put the rest in... <laughs> Good on you, Finn. Yeah, come on. Amen, brother. Um, so in my, you know, I bought, I, at Christmas, I bought a hoodie, which I wear quite a lot. I really like it. And I've got another one exactly the same, another one of the same kind in my cupboard at home for when this one has got holes in and I can't wear it anymore. These trainers that I'm wearing, when I bought these trainers, I put them on and I'm like, oh, they're comfortable and they're black. They go with anything. They fit really well. I'll buy three pairs. This is actually my second pair. All right, so I've got through one pair, I'm on my second pair, and probably in six months to a year when they've gone through the bottom of these, I'll take them, I'll cover it off, they're in a box still, I'll take them out, and I've, and I've still got the same tray. This is me, all right? So I like to wear another of the same kind, 
All right, so you have another of a different kind, which is heteros, and then another of the same kind, which is alos. I'm a bit strange, right? I, I can feel your sympathy right now. This word here is alos. It's another of the same kind. And what he's saying, uh, same as what? Well, Jesus is saying, the same as me. I'm going to send you someone who is the same as me. It's, it's the same kind, it's another one, but it's the same kind. So the relationship that you disciples have with me, Jesus was saying, you can now have that same relationship with the Holy Spirit. You can walk with the Holy Spirit, you can talk with the Holy Spirit, you can wake up in the morning and say good morning to the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He's there. The good thing about the Holy Spirit though is that he's going to abide with you forever. He's going to stay with you and he's going to be available to everybody at the same time. This was good news to his disciples, another of the same kind. Jesus said, I'm sending you another just like me. Now every believer, every person who responds to that zero moment, to that moment where Jesus says, come follow me, the Holy Spirit is given to that person for this reason, so that we can have the same as Jesus. We can have that relationship with us all the time. The presence of God. The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is there as our guide, as our comforter, as our encourager, as our friend, as our advocate, as somebody who gives gifts to us. The Holy Spirit has so many great functions, more than that even. And he's in all of us. And everybody who has the Holy Spirit has the ability to hear, hear him speak to us and direct us. But a disciple doesn't just hear the Holy Spirit. A disciple heeds the Holy Spirit. A disciple follows the Holy Spirit. A disciple takes what the Holy Spirit says, the way the Holy Spirit directs us, and he follows that direction. Following the Holy Spirit is not like following someone on social media. All right. I know we, we use that word a lot, follow. I'm going to follow this guy on Twitter. I'm going to follow this guy on Facebook. Uh, following, you follow somebody on Twitter, what happens? You get to read their tweets. It's a bit removed. You follow somebody from Instagram, you get to see their posts, you get to see their pictures. Uh, but it's still, again, it's, you have this removed relationship from this person that you're following. The Holy Spirit is not like that. Um, a few years ago, we went to Sweden on a holiday and we were visiting friends who had moved over there, they were living over there and they invited us to come and stay and I said, okay, well, if you can give us directions from Stockholm Airport, we'll come and we'll see you at your place. And they said, no, 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 that's not going to work. Uh, it's like we live in the middle of nowhere next to a lake in a kind of a cow's cabin. You're not going to be able to follow direct. We'll come to the airport and we'll bring you back. So. We had a hire car, we went to the airport, we picked up our hire car, our friends joined us, and then we had to follow them to their place. Uh, they said the sat-nav is not mapped for a lot of this area, so you're just going to have to follow us. And I don't know if you've ever, ever followed somebody behind them in the car, and you just like, have to pay real attention. Particularly when you're in a foreign country, and you can't even pronounce the names that you're reading. Uh, on, the, on the signpost, you know no idea what they're saying on the side, but so you just, you've got your eyes fixed on that car in front and you're following them, if they speed up, you speed up, if they turn left, you go left, if they turn right, you go right, they slow down, you slow down, you follow them, exactly. And if something, if a car comes between you, a Volvo or a tractor, like you're looking around that thing trying to, trying to make sure that you can still see the car in front, that's what it's like following the Holy Spirit. We've got to kind of pay attention to the Holy Spirit. We've got to give him our attention. And sometimes there are things in our life that get between us and the Holy Spirit. There can be habits that we have. There can be attitudes that we have. There can be sin in our lives. There can be offense that we're holding on to. Or in forgiveness, these things prevent us from hearing the Holy Spirit as we should. And we need to be trying to remove those things, getting in front of those things, so that we can follow the Holy Spirit as we as we need to. This is the life of a disciple, to follow the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is always moving. He's always moving. And do you know what direction he's moving in? He's moving in a Jesus direction. He's the Holy, the Holy Spirit is guiding us in a direction towards the shape of Jesus. Because he's another of the same kind as Jesus. 
So my advice to you this morning, for what it's worth, is to listen. Have your ear attentive to the voice of the Holy Spirit in you. And then to obey what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. The whole process of discipleship is bringing you to a place where your life looks more and more like the life of Jesus. And that's what the Holy Spirit specializes in. This is his speciality, that's his direction. The key word when following the Holy Spirit is obedience. The price of success, the price of success as a disciple is obedience. We will only, we will only be successful as a disciple to the level that we are obedient to whatever the Holy Spirit is saying to us, that voice inside us. We'll only make it to the shape of Jesus to the extent that we are obedient to that voice and following that voice. Now if I'm looking for some financial help, Maybe my finances are in a bit of a bad way and I'll, I'll invite a financial advisor to, to, to my home and he'll look at my accounts, he'll look at kind of maybe some of the debts I've got and he'll look at my mortgage and he'll come up with a report and he'll say, look, if you move your money here, if you uh, move your mortgage to this place, if you consolidate this debt here, and he'll give me various advice. Now I have a choice, I can sit there and I can say, actually, I'll come up with my own plan. Or I can take the advice of the expert. And the Holy Spirit is our expert in becoming like Jesus. He's the expert. We want to be on that process. We need to listen to his voice. And we'd be dumb not to follow his lead. All right, I'm, I'm kind of going to finish there. But what I'd like us to do, I'd like just to, to respond this morning, to, to give the Holy Spirit a chance to, um, to be open to what he's saying to us. I wonder if you'll stand with me as we just make a prayer this morning. The Holy Spirit isn't just a, it's not just a distant concept. It's not just some airy, fairy thing over there somewhere. The Holy Spirit is a personal. Yes. He's personal. He's in us. He's a person. And he wants to, he wants to be our friend and he wants to direct the path that we're on. He wants to be living and active. So when we listen to the Holy Spirit, we open ourselves up to his guidance and his wisdom and the direction that God is taking us in. We are not alone in this journey, this disciple shift that we want to make. We're not alone. So I'm going to pray and I really felt God was saying to me today that we should pray and we should be ready and we should be expectant for a fresh outpouring of his Holy Spirit, of his power. I said this in the prayer meeting before the service. Jesus said to his disciples, he said, uh, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit is that power for us to do the mission for us to be the disciples. So I'm going to pray for all of us for a fresh outpouring of his, of his spirit this morning. Lord God, Lord, we come to you humbly as your children. We come to you in awe of you, God. We thank you that you sent another of the same kind, that you sent us another like Jesus to be our guide, to be our friend, to be our comforter. And to be the source of the power that you want to put in us, Lord God. And I pray uh, this morning that you would just do that. Lord, I want to uh, say sorry for the times uh, where we've let things get in the way. Where we've uh, let uh, kind of offense or sin or wrong thought patterns get in the way of that relationship. Lord, I'm sorry for the times where we haven't listened to the Holy Spirit's voice. Lord, I'm sorry for the times when we've heard the, pro the, the uh, direction of the Holy Spirit and we haven't obeyed God. Lord, we want to be obedient to your word. We want to uh, make a declaration today and a commitment to following, to following that Holy Spirit's voice, Jesus. Lord, we submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit. We want to be obedient. 
Lord, I pray that this week we would have a, a revelation, God, a fresh revelation of who you are. As we listen to the Spirit's voice, that we would see you even more for who you are. We would see ourselves for who you've made us to be, God. We would see the value that you have placed onto us, God. And that we would operate and move in power. From this day going forward, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.